Paul Whitley is the fractional CFO at C-Suite Support. With a real passion for helping companies set up and implement financial transformations, Paul gives you the tips to improve processes and drive up bottom line profits, helping your business grow exponentially. Simply put, his goal is to help you achieve your goals. This is CEO Talk with Paul Whitley. Hello, this is Paul Whitley and thank you for joining us today. I'm a fractional CFO that helps companies grow exponentially. In these times of troubled water and all of the issues of COVID and payroll protection and et cetera, would you like to have someone on your team to help you grow your company exponentially and help you avoid some of the pitfalls and some of the costs that you're incurring right now? So if you need some help, please consider getting a hold of us. Today, we've got a discussion that we're gonna be talking about the one decision that can be critical to you to set your company for your profit, for your revenue, and your market share. So with that, we're gonna be talking to Forrest Performance Group, Jason Forrest and Mary Marshall. And with that, I'd like to run a, a short video so that we can get an idea of what they do and how they do it. And so think of your mindset is like your hard drive in your computer system. Basically my entire life, I've spent focused on studying the mindset of the top kind of 1%. Abundance in all areas of your life is your birthright, and that is financially, that's in love and relationships, that's in service to your community, that's in joy. Abundance is your birthright. Do I believe that my effort makes a difference? One of the most important things that you can do to impact your profitability through your employees, which I also believe is the number one profit leak in organizations, is people's productivity and sometimes our circumstances are leading us through inspiration and we are running full speed towards our dreams and sometimes the circumstances in our life feel more like they're leading us from desperation and we are running as fast as we can away from our nightmares but here's the cool thing no matter what the circumstances in your life are right now you're not doing it wrong because both paths end at the same place. I want to introduce you to Jerry, uh, Jason and Mary Forrest. Jason, uh, Mary. It's great to be here. Great to be I here. I like it, I like the couple name. Jerry, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. We'll just take one of those and yeah. go. Uh, you're always in the mindset. What is the warrior mode? What do you do to get ready every day for your mental and physical preparation to try to get this process that you do in helping others get to a top performance? Uh, sure. So, so I wrote a book recently called The Mindset of a Sales Warrior, which talks about 42 mental toughness strategies to up your game, specifically as it relates to being a salesperson. One of the things we talk about in the book is the power of rituals. And so as it relates to Mary and I, we both have a ritual. We wake up at 4.30 every single morning, and then we have um, some meditation time, some you know focused kind of intention time. We both go and work out together and have like a warrior workout that we do that's body weight, resistance training, and running and walking, and that sort of thing. Um, and then just a schedule plan your day. And then of course, uh, some sort of kind of healthy uh, meal. Right now, the two of us are doing inter intermittent fasting, but either that or some, some sort of um, protein, collagen. I have a whole kind of uh, list of, of things that I put in my smoothie every single morning to get going for the day. It's a big list. It's a big list. <laughs> it's a very big list. Well, tell us a little bit about Forest Performance Group and what you want to do to help companies get out of this mess that we're in right now. You know, Paul, thank you. Right now is such a crucial time. And I love that we started with health because we can't do anything if we're not first serving ourselves and fulfilling our own needs. But what we've noticed is that things that were fine in 2019, I'm fine at sales, my processes are fine, my team is fine, is fine equals bankruptcy in 2020. And so if we are, are going to be not just make it through, but thrive and successful, what we need to do is, is turn up, be impeccable with everything that we're doing and turn it up and make sure that, um, that we are being the best that we can be in all areas and focusing on it. Thank you. Jeff, I, I, you yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I do. Because um, I think 
the pandemic, nobody had a playbook for this, and you guys are both great speakers and trainers. Uh, pandemic hits. Is there fear? Is I mean, you're you're warriors, but is there? Oh my goodness, my event just got canceled. How did you deal with that? Well, for us, we, we are we are the Warrior Selling Training Program is considered is right now listed on Global Gurus as the second best sales training program in the world, beating out all of the other major contenders out there. And what was amazing for us is we were very blessed in the sense that 90% of our clients that were in our program prior to COVID happening, they, they were either making their sales goals or some of them are actually selling three times more than the, the counterpart. And it's actually very simple if you think about it, is that that um, in, in you know before COVID, you know, to kind of go, go along with what Mary was saying is that, you know, I think in 2019, um, you didn't have to be impeccable to be a great business professional or great, great have a great business. So, for example, in 2019, it was all about abundance. Everyone was giving money to everyone. There was, the standards weren't really that high. I mean, even us, you know, we had the second best sales training program in the world, but we still lost business to other training companies that had lesser standards and a lower price. What's interesting in 2020 is that people are going to be pickier on who they give their money to in 2020. So we're like in 2019, you'd almost say you'd have three classes of business. You'd have business that was crushing it. You'd have business that was doing okay. And then you have businesses that were basically going under. In 2020, I think there's gonna be two classes of business. I think there will be businesses that are taking market share and their businesses are going under. And so that's the, that's the real shift that's happening right now. And so the businesses that are going to take market share are the ones that have the highest possible standards that have this, this warrior mindset, warrior process and warrior language specifically as it relates to the sales side. So, you know, you think about in business, there's really kind of, um, you know, we say two problems in business, there are sales problems and there's all the other problems, right? Where in 2019, the problem was everyone would talk about, hey, let's have a great culture, let's have operational excellence, you know, let's have fun and games. Well, that's because everything was fine on the sales side. And as long as you have money, you can go spend time building that other side. But right now, no one's really doing that anymore because they don't have revenue to keep the lights on. So that's what we are. We're, we're really on the revenue side to build that side. So then you can go do the other fun stuff. Mary, what causes salespeople to fail? Why, why do people that have been selling for years when they get in the crisis or the crunch no longer perform? Well, the people that have been performing for years that are now not doing well is a mindset issue. And those those come, we call them leashes. So it's anything that, that holds us back, it's fears that we have. And so those can be internal stories we tell ourselves. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I don't know how to do this. Um, it can be um, uh, reluctances, the fears that we have. It can be um, rules that we give ourselves, which is, you know what, it would be insensitive to call somebody right now and ask them for my pro to, to buy my product or service because, you know, there's a pandemic. So we shouldn't do that during pandemic. We, we make up rules that we give ourselves or um, one that I, I hear a lot is, is um, you know, it's really good to call somebody, do follow-up calls three times, but the fourth time, that's when you get annoying. Nobody wants to get a call on the fourth time, but that's a rule we gave ourselves. And so it's, it's that mindset. So when we clear that out, we can now follow our process. So it's anything that stops us from the process because most salespeople, they know what to do. All right, I've got one. <laughs> yeah. um, so a lot has been said about the millennial and the Gen Z generation. Uh, do you find, are they different kinds of salespeople than say boomers? I mean, the, the difference between millennials and I, and I, this is always a fun conversation because I had, a, I had a, I've done a lot of talks on un unleashing the millennial power. And the thing about millennials we need to know is that is, is how they were programmed, right? So they were programmed by, you know, by people that said, okay, if you don't like your grade, then you need to go to your teacher and say, I need a different grade. And, or if you don't like how much playing time you have on the soccer field, you need to go talk to your coach about it. Like they were told that by, by their parents. And so we just need to know the programming of them is that they are more kind of self internally driven of if I don't like how things were going, I need to go kind of call the shots. But they're also very like purpose driven too, because they saw their parents during like the 9-11 times and the 2008 times, they saw them losing all of their retirements because they stuck to one company. You know, their, their parents' generation was all about, I'm gonna choose, uh, I'm gonna choose, you know, kind of uh, money over, um, over, over purpose. Yes. Well, their parents now have told them, hey, don't do that anymore. Choose purpose over money. Yes. And so as far as when I'm concerned, I think millennials are great, just like I think baby boomers are great. You just need to know 
what are their what's their beliefs that's driving their emotions, that's driving their motivations, that's driving their behaviors, and you have to make sure as a coach or as a leader that you're programming them correctly. You're coaching them to what what they know about. I know that uh, sometimes owners think they're the best people to hire their salespeople because they're going to hire people just like themselves usually. And that may or may not be the best case. What do you think about that, Mary? Well, yes. So I think, well, what's great is think about if a company, if you're an owner, which you've probably been an owner, you're an owner, do you really want a company full of you? Do you want to, to handle you? So, Paul? Do you Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. I think everyone, look at Jeff's laughing because we're all scared of a company full of Pauls. You're a great salesperson, but to have everybody there, we, we need some um, some diversity. But why they're not is because a lot of times you have these visionaries. And so they're looking, right? And I'm sitting here with a, a group of visionaries. They're looking all over the place, everything. What could we do? Bigger pictures. We need people that are following processes because the best salespeople are following processes. And so if we're attracted to somebody because of the conversation and the visionary conversation we're having with them, it could be, they could be great and have so many assets, but we need somebody that's following a process and it's gonna be procedural based. And I know you get excited about this too. It's just really just the biases. I mean, that's the main thing, right? We have a, right. a, a likability bias. So, you know, we're gonna hire people like us. Well, if you're not the best salesperson in your company, then you're not a good, a good, good uh, in, uh, filtering system of that, right? Or if you personally don't like salespeople or you don't respect salespeople, well, you might have this uh, total warrior-like person that you're interviewing for a sales job, but you get turned off by them because they're too aggressive but you wouldn't want them working for the competition selling against you. They would be taking sales away from you. So you gotta be careful on those, those biases. And you stepped right into what I do as an integrator. I'm also a visionary, but I'm an integrator. I come in to help companies put those systems together, put their ERP, their CRM, those kind of things put together. So thank you for the lead in right into me. Mm -hmm. What other kinds of things does FPG do to help their companies that they work with in terms of finding the salespeople, training the salespeople, et cetera? So our main focus right now, we've, we've shifted our company. We, we are the fastest growing sales training company in North America the last, based on Inc, the last five or six years in a row. But what's interesting is right now, 34% of our business is actually on our, our sales recruiting side. So we're really reinventing the recruiting side. What we've done is we've merged three companies in one. We go and, and find the salesperson for a, a, a company. Uh, very few companies are actually sales focused when, when it comes to recruiting. Uh, then we use third party assessments to hold it accountable, uh, as well as both of us are master practitioners in neuro linguistic programming, which is the study of how do, how do people talk and how is it connected to their brain wiring, which tells a lot about their programming and beliefs. And then last, we put them in a 90 day warrior selling training program uh, to make sure that they're onboarded properly. So basically we're handing a, a, a client um, a salesperson on a silver platter, and then we give them a 90 day guarantee if they don't perform, we'll place them for free. Do all recruiters use the same kind of process to eliminate the, the people that are not aggressive, that are not going forward, that will not make the grade? They okay. do not. What, what is the difference and what does it give you when you talk uh, to a company to bring in a salesperson? Yeah, you know, Paul, the funny thing is that originally it was not our intention to go towards recruiting. Um, and what happened is we were going to recruiters going, we have this great assessment. Mm -hmm. We have this great assessment we want you to use. It shows the leashes. It shows if the person's going to be uh, profitable because here's a, a terrible statistic, as most statistics are, it's 80% of salespeople fail in their first year, 80%. Wow. And so we, we have this fix for it, but they didn't want to use the, they didn't want to use the assessment because they said, well, it takes too long. It means that they, um, it, it, it takes down the pool of people that I could go and, and show someone. We said, exactly. That's why we love it because it narrows down that pool to the top people. And that's what we wanted to do. And so we could not, um, we couldn't find anybody else that was using it. Anybody that was, that we could take our clients to and say, use this recruiter. They're going to find top people for you. We couldn't find anybody that we could refer to for salespeople. And so we decided to do it ourselves. What, what percentage of companies don't have any training process at all? They just basically uh, hand them uh, the keys and say, go sell cars. Um, oh, 99%. Really? Yeah, I mean, which is, which is it's a good point, Jeff, because um, a, a book I wrote a couple years ago was called WTF, which stands for Why Training Fails. And uh, obviously, right? And 164 billion is spent every year on training. 70% fails to ever achieve an ROI. Wow. And one of the philosophies in the book is that 
is that most people, you know, they it, you would never get on an airplane with someone that said, hey, this is Jason from Southwest Airlines, and I just went to a two-day class on how to fly a plane, and I got this thing figured out. I got a certification, I put it on LinkedIn as a badge, <laughs> and no one would do that, right? right? But yet, we would give a salesperson a, you know, $5 million revenue territory or quota, and say, here's a book to read, or here's a seminar to go to, um, and that's the con- extent of the training. But training, by definition, is to change behavior. Yes. And so, yeah, so that's that's why our programs are 90 days at least in length to have that behavioral modification to go on. And what, what else do you do to su- make sure the salesperson succeeds, not only for 90 days, but with your clients taking them out through the year so that the company succeeds? Absolutely, we do ongoing training. So we need to make sure that they are successful for them and they are the fastest. And right now, um, they all are. They all are outperforming uh, the, the team and the best people that were at the company beforehand. And it's it's ongoing training. It's, that's the bottom line. And what do you do with the companies to ensure these people are successful? Well, the, the main thing that we do, to, we focus on five specific things, right? So uh, number one, all of our training is very tactical. So it's very how-based versus what and why. So like Simon Sinek, Power of Why is great, but everyone hears that, gets all jacked up, and they go, yeah, but how do I actually deliver a selling message like that? So we tell them how to do it. Um, or number two, we focus on the mindset, right? Removing those leashes that hold people back from execution that drives performance. Number three is that we teach the sales managers how to be the Bill Belichick, Nick Saban, Pete Carroll of coaching. And then number four is everything is program-based versus event-based. And number five is we kind of uh, engulf the whole thing in what we call our revenue operating system to make sure that the CRM, compensation, award structures, uh, organizational alignment is all in alignment to create that sales organization that happens to do blank. I've been involved in a couple of conversations with your trainers where they actually got involved with the company. The salesperson had a sale that they were having difficulty to close and they said, well, let me be on that call with you. Let's see if we can close it. Can you share how you do that? Absolutely. Well, I think that's the most, that's the most important thing. All of our trainers, they're practitioners which means these are these are not somebody who studied sales. They're not a researcher that's decided, I'm gonna go tell you the science behind it. We have a science, but these all of our trainers are people that this is what they do. This is what they do every day. They have been top in sales in their companies. They are still in sales. They're all required to sell and the purpose for it, so they can jump in, so they can sell through uh, the people that they're coaching and they can come in and they're speaking from experience. So every time they get on, it's not like, 25 years ago, I did a sale and this is how I did it. It's, hey, the last hour I was talking to this person and this is what happened. And the other side of that, Paul, is we've invited people to come in with us selling. So come in and participate in the sales process um, as the observer, as also going in and helping them close sales. So I've got one, I, you know, I, I, I think about sales and sometimes I think about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and Alec Baldwin and, and coffee is for closers. Uh, do you think people have a, like a mental block when it comes to sales that they think it has to be like a used car salesman or it has to be like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and, and, and what are your thoughts about that? Uh, sure. So I'm, that's that's actually a personal mission of mine. So um, my personal mission is to bring back or ignite the pride, purpose, and respect of professional selling. And uh, it's like anything. You know, people don't have a problem with uh, with uh, salespeople in general. They have a problem with some salespeople that project boring, unhelpful, or unethical behaviors. People don't have a problem with lawyers, or they have a problem with some lawyers that are unethical, etc. Right? Right. So the problem is, is that it goes back to that kind of thing you said earlier that majority of people are not training their salespeople. And so if they're not training them to be professional, and at the same time, maybe they're in a culture of manipulation, and that's a big difference, right? It's, is that the same techniques that I would use to persuade you to do something would benefit you are the same techniques I would use to manipulate you to do something that would harm you. Yes. The same techniques. The problem is, is that back in the early 80s, those movies came out, and so there was this whole revolution called soft selling or relationship selling that was very big. And they said, hey, don't be that over there. So the pendulum swung completely the other side. But what all the research has said is that relationship selling, soft selling approach, it doesn't actually move the needle. So the, mo- the most successful salespeople are the ones that are assertive, but they're assertive and respectful. They're provocative and educational. Wow. And they have to do that, not, hey, Jeff, you know, let me go take you out to a ball game. And as long as I keep doing that enough, eventually <laughs> you will buy from me. That approach does not work. Wow. Let me ask you, recently we've been talking about salespeople and training. Do your salespeople ever get involved in training? 
Like are our salespeople training? Yes. Oh my goodness, yes. So, so it was fun. Several years ago, Jason had the idea. Now we've always had internal training. We've always trained several hours a week. Um, ourselves, so our teams. But a couple of years ago, he said, you know what? I believe so much in training that I want every salesperson, every trainer salesperson in our organization to have a minimum of eight hours or maximum, we want eight hours every single week of training for them. And so on my side, I'm going, but you know, they have jobs to do. <laughs> what are we going to do with eight hours? And Jason, Jason said, we're going to do an experiment because I believe that we can outperform taking one day off and, and training. We in those four other days we will outperform because they're gonna be so well trained. And he was right and we've done it and continued it ever since. And the other uh, other departments train about five hours a week. But yes, I and I think that's one of the most important things is when you say you stand for something and believe it, do you do it? Are you really a part of it? Absolutely. Well I want to thank both of you for coming today and being part of the CEO talks with uh, myself. Also uh, in, in terms of what I do and work with, I'd like to offer to, to help and go from there. And in terms of the show or what we're doing here, we are trying to help companies grow. We're trying to help companies find revenue. And I learned a long time ago as a CFO that if I was not involved in the revenue cycle, then I was not the most uh, helpful to the company and probably third man on the totem pole in the, the management cycle. So revenue is number one. Managing the revenues, number two. Counting the beans when they all come in, it's really number three. So I learned a long time ago to help myself by inserting myself in the revenue cycle and helping companies find verticals, processes, and things to do along with doing all the financials. So I absolutely think that top line revenue is the top place you start. The one big decision. So. In that, next week, we're going to be uh, asking a gentleman by the name of Jeff Worley with Columbia Consulting Group. Jeff works with companies to help them in startup mode and hyper growth mode. And more importantly, he also works with companies that are in distress mode. He's going to be helping you determine, decide, and stay out of bankruptcy and stay into business. So right now with all the COVID situation and the revenue issues that we have from the companies being either shut down or reduced in size and people can't buy, Jeff is right on target with the kind of business he does. He's part of C-Suite and we welcome you to come in next week to uh, listen to Jeff. And one of the things to always remember is that you can help get anything in life that you want as long as you help enough other people get what they want. Credit that to Zig Ziglar, a friend in the past, and I believe, uh, Jason, you also were involved in Zig Ziglar's class when you were growing up. He was my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid. That's Outstanding. Cool. Well, Zig, uh, we, had, we all went to the same, same pew in the same place, and so I share that. Uh, let's all get what we want by helping others get what they want. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>